Morag from uh, Home Energy Scotland and Isa from Shetland Island Citizen Advice Bureau and they'll be giving a talk. We'll start with Morag. Uh, if you've got any questions, just type them in the chat, uh, but please make sure that in the chat box you've got session marked rather than event, otherwise you're posting messages to everyone. Let's try and keep the chat going lovely. I'll turn off my camera now and pass over to Morag to start our presentation. Thanks, Alan. Hi, everybody. Um, bear with me a second till I get my screen shared with you all. And apologies that you all had to hear our chat there. It's uh, quite a new system, this. So, um, yeah, good to see how it all works. So hopefully everybody can, can see my slides there. And yeah, feel free to type away some questions and we'll get to those at the end. Um, so my name is Morag. I'm the Senior Partnerships Officer with Home Energy Scotland. For anyone who doesn't know, uh, Home Energy Scotland is funded by the Scottish Government and managed by the Energy Saving Trust. And it's our mission to help people in Scotland to create warmer homes, reduce their bills and help to tackle climate change. So we've got a network of five local advice centres which cover the whole of Scotland. Um, I work within the South East, so covering Edinburgh, the Lothians, Fife and the Scottish Borders. At the end of my slides, I've got just a, a generic um, contact email address which anyone can use to help you to get in touch with your own local partnerships contact. So I started in this role and with Home Energy Scotland on a Monday in March. And by Tuesday lunchtime, we were all being sent home with our computers to navigate homeworking. So it's been a really steep learning curve for myself, but also for the network as a whole. So I'm hoping today just to give, just to share a little bit of um, our experience in Home Energy Scotland in the hope that there's something within that that you find uh, helpful for your own projects. So we were really lucky at Home Energy Scotland because we were able to adapt quickly to homeworking. Um, our advisors were able to take calls immediately, so there was no gap in our service provision and our advice line was able to continue as normal. Um, I'm very sorry if you can hear any background noise, but they've decided to start cutting the grass outside just, just at this point. Um, so as you'll hopefully know, uh, Home Energy Scotland is much more than just a telephone advice line. We'd also normally be out and about at events, delivering talks and workshops, and also going into people's homes, which obviously had to uh, come to a halt in March, and we've therefore had to be a bit creative and look at the way that we're delivering our services. Now, bear with me. There we go. So we began delivering webinars and we did these on a, a range of different topics from looking after your energy bills to renewable technologies and e-bikes. And we used to go to webinar software for these. Um, we liked this platform because it gave us control of the entire process. So from registration to the, the follow-up support after the webinar. And it's got lots of useful features within it um, to help you to analyze the success of webinar events afterwards. Other platforms have introduced similar new features um, over the last eight months as they've kind of caught up with demand, um, but we do still continue to use uh, GoToWebinar as our preferred option. Our technical team have adapted to providing support remotely and they can support householders using the Home Renewables Selector tool, which is available on our website. And they can also complete remote home visits for householders um, where they've got plans of their home. So, for example, if it's a, a new build, they might still have the plans to hand and they can do remote home visits that way. Our energy carer team who support our most vulnerable householders can facilitate three-way three -way calls uh, with trusted third parties or where there's interpretation services needed. And during the October holidays, we also offered a day of face to face virtual appointments um, with vulnerable families, which was through a partnership with a, a local project in schools in Edinburgh. So we used Zoom for these one to one appointments and uh, we felt that that was a platform that many people were quite familiar with by this point. And we also created a, a robust and focused registration form. And that allowed us to collect information in advance that would really help us to tailor the, the support and advice that we were giving. So our home visits are slowly beginning to restart where it's necessary and where it's possible. And obviously with all the appropriate safety measures in place. 
but I do think that, that some of the ways that we are delivering and some of the ways that we do things have probably changed for good now. So as well as working directly with households, our expert advisors also work with organisations and community groups. All our meetings and training sessions moved online and we had to be really flexible with regards to the platforms that we used as different partners had very different access um, ability. So we've used Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Skype, as well as GoToWebinar that I mentioned earlier. We've also delivered pre-recorded training sessions where it has not been possible to get everybody together, although we do prefer that live environment where we can encourage questions and, and interactions. So again, as you hopefully know, um, we can and we do support community groups and projects in a range of ways. And by partnering with us, you can help your community members to save energy and money and keep their homes warm. So we can help you with developing your projects, supporting funding applications, and we can support events, share resources, um, including foreign language materials, and we can offer training for staff or volunteers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you can also refer community members directly and securely to us for support. And this is particularly if they're struggling to heat their homes or worrying about their, their fuel bills. And the way to do that is the Home Energy Scotland portal, which is the easiest way to refer householders to us for free and impartial advice. It allows direct referrals into Home Energy Scotland at any time and it's secure and that information enters our database for us to follow up with. Another benefit is that you'll be able to see the referral outcomes for the people that you've referred up to a year after the referral, so you wouldn't need to then contact us. And that's, for example, whether they've been referred to a scheme such as Warmer Home Scotland for further support. And we also offer um, a series of workshops for community groups, which are completely free and a great way to bring community members together. And we try to make these as interactive as possible with quizzes and activities and really encourage questions and, and input throughout these workshops. So this is our standard menu of workshop offerings, which can help you to get everybody involved and learn how to make more sustainable choices and ultimately help to tackle the climate emergency. We're also flexible to the needs of our partners, so please do let us know if there's something different that you would like us to explore with you. So the first one, helping to save energy at home. As you can imagine, um, lots of people have seen their energy costs rise because of the, the COVID-19 outbreak and the, the lockdown. This um, workshop has been designed to help participants to stay in control of their bills and to reduce their impact on the environment. We've also partnered with Scottish Water who are the biggest user of electricity in this country to help people to save water, energy and money. So around a fifth of a household's heating bills are spent on heating water. And this workshop just helps to use water more wisely and therefore keep energy bills down as well. We also explore transport and travel, which are major sources of the release of carbon dioxide and other harmful emissions. And by Joining this session, uh, we look at the scale of the challenge of emissions in Scotland, the health benefits of active travel and the available support to help you to adopt greener transport options, including um, e-bikes and electric cars. And then finally, our Love Food Hate Waste workshop is funded by Zero Waste Scotland, and this aims to raise awareness of the issues caused by food waste. So we hope that participants will discover new ideas for food planning, for portioning, freezing and using up leftovers and ultimately save money on food costs by not wasting. So I just wanted to share an example of one of these workshops that we have undertaken in a digital environment. So we worked with NKS, which is a health and welfare project for South Asian women and their families living in Edinburgh. And the NKS Climate Challenge Initiative Project offers free support to these women and their families um, to reduce carbon emissions in areas of food, travel, waste and energy. So the project includes home energy advice to help reduce home energy use and tackle fuel poverty. And the organisation regularly refers householders to Home Energy Scotland for further support. We were asked to support a series of workshops and topics included energy efficiency and bills and also looking at renewable technologies. 
We circulated a registration form in advance of these workshops, which is really important for us for our reporting as we're funded by Scottish Government. And it also allowed participants to request any further support from Home Energy Scotland. Again, we held these sessions on Zoom and we got around 20 people per session. And the discussions were, were really lively at this session. There was loads of great questions, um, but we also really benefited from the presence of the project leads who were able to kind of stop us in our tracks, just check understanding amongst the group and if necessary, translate some of the things that we were saying um, if that was needed by the group as well. So um, really good collaborative approach there. So what have we learned so far from our digital engagements. The first thing is that we need to be uh, flexible, as I mentioned, about the platforms that we use. There isn't sort of one size that fits all groups and all householders. We've also run sessions at very different times of the day, depending on the audience. So we tend to do our employee engagement at lunch times or sessions in the evenings for community groups. As I mentioned, we also need to collect registrations and this can be sleek and built in with some programmes such as with our webinar technology, but it can be a bit more difficult when um, running workshops with other partners and community groups. So any support with this aspect is, is much appreciated. We've also experienced people not showing up to digital events, but to be honest, this is not really any different from um, face to face events and, and can't really be helped. And then finally, a bit of a positive is that our Home Energy Scotland centres uh, cover large geographical areas. So one advantage has been the removal of that need to, to travel across great distances. We also are not needing to arrange and pay for, for example, venues and refreshments and those sorts of things. And it, it does mean that we can manage engagement with less staff and taking less time out of our day. So it does in some ways help our capacity as well. And then finally, just some quite um, technical learnings around the webinars specifically. So we found that we benefited from having uh, an extra person there who was dedicated to providing that technical support if we were able to spare them. So that allows the presenter, I mean, I guess a bit like today, allows the presenter to focus on speaking and that additional person can look at the questions, um, switch presenters if you've got more than one presenter. If we're including a Q&A, then we would often have some pre-prepared questions lined up just in case of any awkward silences or any delaying questions coming in. It also allows us to kind of reiterate the key messages that we're trying to get across. Um, polls within these um, platforms are a great way of interacting with your audience and it can help you to judge how much that group already knows. So can help to guide whether you are quite technical in your presentation or you, you tend to stick to the basics based on how they respond. Um, we'd also recommend logging in earlier, so about 20 minutes or so, just make sure all the technology, all the connectivity is, is working okay and allows you time to fix these problems early. But having a backup just in case someone has any um, problems is a good idea. So making sure that somebody else has access to all the slides and could take over if needed. We find that plugging in directly to a router rather than relying on Wi-Fi um, can help to improve the connection speed and the ensure the quality is maintained throughout. And also using headsets can help to reduce um, feedback and means that your speaker remains clear throughout. So finally, I was just trying to think of some things that we would still like to try and um, that we've not quite got round to yet. So we'd like to explore podcasts as a, a short, snappy way to share energy advice. Um, as a network, we're exploring live chat options. So that's certainly my own preferred way to, to interact with services. We're also always aware of the importance of case studies. So the impact it can have when you see someone like you who's already made um, a leap, for example, to renewable technology. And I think that there is potential to, to bring these to life digitally, um, for example, through a virtual visit to the person's home or a bit of a Q&A session with them. So these are just some of the ways that we are delivering energy advice remotely. 
we'll never have the, the creativity of a local community project. And I know that there's some fantastic work that's going on out there. Um, I've seen a lot of familiar names and faces here already. And um, also just to say a big congratulations to the, the Gate Church International in Dundee. Um, who've just received their seventh gold award from Eco Congregation Scotland for their work with the community. So it'd be great if we have time um, after the presentations to hear some of the ways that the people here have been um, delivering energy advice this year or any ideas for future work that you would like to share with the group. If anyone would like more information on the Home Energy Scotland portal or on any of our workshop offerings, then there's some details on screen there for you as well. And that's everything from me. Thanks very much, Mark. That was excellent. Uh, yeah, folks can are very welcome to um, post the questions in the chat space, and we'll try and take them after the next uh, presentation. Uh, so we'll collate them. Um, I've definitely got one in my head for you, Mark. So I'll, I'll ask it later. <laughs> um, yeah, it sounds like we're all learning to convert to this kind of digital way of working, and it would be interesting to. To hear from you maybe a bit little later on whether you think it's more effective or less effective than than physical sure. okay, so yeah but that later on uh i'd like to switch to isha if that's okay if you can set up your screen and we'll do the next presentation and then q a afterwards hi can you see and hear me okay yeah we can see you yeah and how's that we all go. Slides of it. Hi, hi everybody. Um, my name is Isa, and I'm joined by my colleague Elliot. Elliot Tate, who you can see down the bottom. Um, we both work for a CCF project up in Scotland. Um, our project is run by the local Citizens Advice Bureau, which is a volunteer-led charity where citizens help fellow citizens. This is the second stage of our project. We completed the first two years in, in March this year, and we were really pleased. Um, to receive funding to continue for another two years. So I'll start with a quick introduction to our community. Shetland is it, it's a wonderful place. Um, it some, has some of the most incredible and it has a, a very, very strong active community. But living in a remote rural island does bring its challenges. The climate here is harsh. Um, the wind factor is significant <laughs> to say the least. Um, most homes are old and hard to heat and energy costs here are higher than the mainland. Um, the result of this is 53% of households in Shetland are in fuel poverty, and that rises to 81% among people um, who receive benefits. If you compare that to the Scottish average of 25%, you can see that we have a real problem with, with fuel poverty in Shetland. So our project was set up to tackle this. Um, we help Shetlanders to minimise their energy bills by cutting the amount of energy that they actually use. The positive spin-off of this, of course, is that they also reduce their carbon footprint um, of their household in the process. So we have four main aims. We, um, at home visits, we show people how small behaviour changes can lead to using less energy. We help people to access grants and loans for installing things like insulation and new heating systems. And we encourage households to adopt renewables. And the fourth thing that we do is help Shetlanders understand their influence on the climate and through climate literacy activities. So we try to work with the most vulnerable people in our community. So older people and those with health problems or people on low incomes and in receipt of benefits. This group is often seen as, as hard to reach in terms of climate engagement, but because we're based within a citizens advice bureau, it puts us in a good position um, to reach them. The way we engage this group is by demonstrating that we can tackle both fuel poverty and reduce somebody's environmental impact at the same time. Um, it's worked really well in the past, um, and we quite often see people taking their first step, the first step on their environmental journey. So pre-COVID, at the beginning of the year, we had a, a great plan building on um, what we'd done in the first three years and first two years and what we'd learned. So we had a steady stream of requests for home visits, we had regular drop-in appointments at our office, booking to the community hubs for outreach clinics, and a full list of community events that we would to the sunset to um, to change everybody's, everybody's minds. Um, but of course, um, all of these activities aren't safe at the minute, so we've had to adapt how we deliver our project, same as, as everybody else. So it was quite tempting to focus on what we couldn't do at the beginning. Um, I think it's fair to say we spent a fair bit of time 
focusing on that, um, really because we were almost entirely reliant on um, face to face delivery. But we realized, of course, this wasn't getting us anywhere. Um, so we took some time to think instead about what we can do safely. Um, people still need our support in Shetland, um, as the same across the country. So we had to adjust really how we reach them. Those people are still there. It's just a matter of how we actually um, communicate with them. So um, to speak a little bit about this, I'm going to hand over to Elliot and he'll um, speak about what we've been up to since April. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. Um, so as a kind of a safe alternative to to uh, face to face home visits, we decided to do um, um, more of, kind of a remote energy <clears throat> clinics. And we found that um, uh, what we offered the 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 focus share and basically was a was a one hour appointment either by phone or by zoom um and we found the level of engagement quite really, really quite good um I'm very happy with it so far um so we offered originally um Seattle, there's four specific dates um that i think possibly nudge um people to to get in touch with us um to to, to you know, take up one of those slots um which worked really well uh, we also used a kind of a triage system where if somebody came in that was you know, in desperate need of some sort of assistance or help, then we would, um, you know, we would make those urgent cases um, our priority, really. Um, most of the sort of advice that we gave um, was centered around uh, things like installing insulation and renewable measures, which I found was quite interesting um, during COVID. We found that it was a good way to engage with somebody um, to start a conversation um, and to think about behavior changes. It was a good, um, good way to kind of start that conversation going. Um, we've had to add extra dates to each of our um, uh, energy clinics that we've done, and we've had around 60 energy clinics since April, which has been really positive, and it's been a good way to engage in what we used to do in the face-to-face -face, uh, engagement. Um, next slide, yeah. <clears throat> um, we're starting to organise more uh, remote clinics, um, and this time uh, really concentrating on specific parts of Shetland. Um, I mean, it's a small island, but there are, you know, um, you know, different islands dotted around. So, you know, you can't always, um, even when we were doing face-to-face, -face, it was sometimes difficult to organise uh, in, in remote locations. So concentrating on a, on a certain um, place in Shetland, I think definitely um, improves engagement in that area. Um, and we found that, I suppose, churning out the same sort of uh, energy clinic again and again wouldn't have hold the same sort of weight as, as doing it in a specific area in Shetland. Um, and one of the issues that I think Issa touched on is that, you know, fuel poverty is a big issue and, and especially in some of the outer isles in Shetland, um, fuel poverty is really high and those folk you know, need, need a lot more assistance as maybe folk on the mainland. Yeah. Fine. Uh, sorry, hopping between two screens here. Um, so, um there's one more um, or two more activities we we're just going to mention. So the first one that we're, we're just on the cusp of, of launching um, that we're just finalising is delivering workplace energy advice. Um, so I guess similar to tomorrow, I um, spoke about uh, Home Energy Scotland, but this is this is really new to us. Um, so we plan to approach local employers um, offering to set up a remote clinic specifically for their staff and to um, approach to, to reaching people in our community. So with many of us working at home, obviously domestic energy use is rising. And the, the thing that we're communicating to employers um, is a survey that was carried out, um, I think it was this summer, by USwitch, and it estimated that households working from home will use 25% um, more electricity and 17% more gas each day um, because of spending more time at home. Um, this would mean a yearly increase of £195 if a customer is, is on a standard variable tariff. So financially, you know, employers really need to, to support their staff. And because of an expected cost like this, um, most of us would struggle at the best of times, never mind right now. <clears throat> so the clinic will work in much the same way as our other, our other clinics, but this time arranged specifically through a local business. Um, we've shared the, the leaflet here, as you can see on the screen. Um, we really wanted to highlight to the people that we're approaching um, that it's more important than ever that they support their staff to reduce their energy use. And we also wanted to make it clear that this advice is, is really bespoke to Shetland. So all communities bring their own issues in terms of housing stock and typical um, heating setups um, and demographics, of course. So we're, we're, we're really keen to let people know that our advisors are local um, and familiar with typical Shetland scenarios. Um, we also um, 
one of the things that we promised an organization is that we'll provide a figure to them um, for the total carbon saving that we achieve um, through their own specific clinic. Um, they can then share this um, number with their staff or with funders or with their board um, or through their own reports, which hopefully, um, hopefully this will then encourage their staff to keep um, continuing these um, energy saving behaviours that they've adopted after our advice um, long into the future. That's the intention. As I say, we haven't actually launched this yet, but it's going to be something we're, we're just about to do um, next month. So um, we can keep in touch and let you know how it goes. Um, so the last thing that we do is this is Erti. I think he's actually perched behind Elliot at, at the minute. Um, so we um, try to be fairly active on social media um, and it also gives us images that we can use in the printed press as well because um, energy efficiency is not the most glamorous um, issue so having a local chap um, in this little Shetland jersey um, in all of these places around the home that would be potentially um, places that people can save energy um, really helps us to communicate energy saving tips because let's be honest if, if any of us work in energy saving it's not a very easy thing to do and um, so having this little chap and his silly um, puns and things sometimes you find people engage with that a bit more than, than they maybe would at just a, a, a straightforward fact and um, so I suspect a lot of what we could do could work in other communities um, and as Morag said we'd be really happy to speak to others and, and hear what you're up to and, and, and share anything that, that we've, we've found works well. Thanks. Brilliant, really, really, really enjoyable slides and talk. Thanks so much to Isha and to Elliot. Uh, I think we can open up uh, to questions. Uh, I'll be a little bit selfish and throw mine in first, just just into the nice part. I think uh, it's kind of already been answered slightly there already, but um, you know, the Green Homes Network I thought was really quite an, a powerful way of motivating people to see another house that's already been converted and upgraded and to learn from that. And I wondered with COVID, how we do that digitally, how do we actually get these houses showcasing each other? Yeah, when I mentioned case studies and that idea of, of virtually exploring somebody's home, that's that's absolutely what I had in mind. And um, it's great that Lewis was able to, to chip in there because she would know better than me what the, the plans are sort of generally for mm. the network. So um, it seems like quite a, a good way of doing it in a digital world, provided you've got the the people that are, are comfortable with that. There is a number of ways of engaging with the Greens Homes Network, whether um, you know, reading a, an already prepared case study through to actually having a chat over the phone with the householder. So when somebody signs up to the Green Homes Network, they very much um, put down their preference and in, in how involved they want to be. So um, there might be people who perhaps didn't, didn't want people traipsing through their homes, but are a bit more open to that, that virtual um, exploring of their homes, so it might actually open some more doors as well. Thanks, that's great. Um, and again, selfish again for me because I've just thought of these questions, but I think the second one for me is obviously COVID is making a lot of people work from home or be in, be in their house an awful lot more. And, and, and I think as the presentation showed, um, you know, the, the number of hours and the number of appliances that are on and heating systems on is, is greater and the costs are going to be greater. And I wonder what we can do to try and really focus on that and help people find solutions that can, you know, help them keep the cost down, but keep cosy and, and keep working at the same time. Yeah, I've just done a quick um, panicked message to our um, senior advisors because they're the ones that are speaking to people on the phones every day, so we'd know a lot better than me if there's been any trends around this. Um, and they've reported back that, they've, that it's not something they advise on regularly um, the, in terms of the technology, but very much part of their advice is the more that you can um, have control of your heating system. So with whatever those heating controls are, and the more you're aware of it and monitoring it and managing it efficiently, the, the greater impact it's going to have on your bills, um, but they haven't so far seen an increase in interest in, in those smart technologies. Um, for me, myself, we've just been given a, a room thermometer from our work and it's just become slightly obsessive checking it and um, seeing what, what temperatures I can manage with. And I think being at home, 
I'm able to, to manage my heating possibly more effectively. I think the beauty of these smart technologies is if you're out for the day and you want your home to be warm when you're coming home, you can text it and have it ready for you at that temperature. Whereas when you're kind of here all day, <laughs> every day, um, it's a lot easier to, to get up and adjust it um, depending on what, what's needed. But having the thermometer, keeping an eye on it just gives you that reminder that it's not as cold as you think it is and a blanket or a jumper would <laughs> do the same job for me personally. That's, that's a very good point, yes. Yeah. We're, a thick, we're a thick jumper to start with. Yeah. Uh, Isha, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I'll, I'll let Elliot speak about the um, number of people that are oh, um, But something that I would say is that we've provided um, energy monitors in the past. Um, so that's, I know that's not the same as a hive or nest system, but in terms of the, the in-home display unit um, that allows people to interact with their energy use and actually follow it and track it. Um, I know it doesn't have the same controls um, as the other systems do, um, but that's something we've found to work quite well, haven't we, Elliot? But I think sometimes you can, you can often tell if it's relevant to somebody because we, we get people coming to us with huge big lists of meter readings. And I guess they're the kind of people that that sort of system will work with because they're obviously already engaging at a higher level than, than myself, for example. Um, so if they have that greater information through Hive or just an energy monitor, then they're likely to really benefit from that. But then there are other people that, you know, you could recommend a system like that, but if they're not already engaging um, at all, it's maybe a, a bigger journey for them to take. Um, so it might not have the same um, impact, I suppose. I don't know if you've got yeah. anything to share earlier. Well, that. I think, I think yeah, one of the fundamentals when I, when I do my home visits or my Zoom calls now is to try and, I mean, not everybody is switched on when it comes to energy. And it's to try and engage, and I suppose in some ways, you know, what different appliances use um, different things in the home. And I suppose, you know, the thing that I usually focus on is heating because that's just the biggest percentage of your of your, of your home energy. But it's just to look at other things too that, that could be around the house. So, I mean, those energy monitors are a great way of, of, of gauging, you know, what different appliance uses what. Um, and, and it lets the it lets the person think about, um, you know, their their cost, their fuel cost, definitely when when they're when they're doing something. Um, so the other great thing is that you, you actually set a budget as well. So if you have a direct um, debit with an energy company, um, the energy monitor, monitor will monitor your usage over thirty days, and it'll say whether you're, you know, coming up to the point of of, of going over your direct debit or, or, or slightly below. And it's it's a good, I suppose, target for folk to aim to is to try and get below that where possible. Sorry for the audio feedback there. I'm dialed into two systems at the same time. It's chaotic. Uh, thanks very much for that. Elliot. That's a good point. I wonder. I wonder if um, is RT going to be starring in any any movies or, or more more slides? Has he got a COVID uh, angle on him? Poor Ant. He, he was stuck in the office for about six months. Um, so I took him home, but my kids are absolutely my kids are absolutely terrified of him. So <laughs> he's had to stay. He's had to stay in the bedroom with me. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I take it out sometimes just to you know remind the kids that he's always around. He's always watching. So, yeah. Really? One thing we were thinking about was um, we're looking to do a few more case studies because we've got the benefit of having done the project and we've got a few um, households, local households that we can that can really flag a flag for different technologies or different behaviour changes and whatever, and then we can show the carbon and financial savings from that. Um, but still, a case study is not the easiest thing to encourage somebody to read. So if, if we pop Ertie on the front of it, or if we get Ertie to sit on top of a heat pump or on top of a new boiler, I think I think that's where he comes into his own. <laughs> I think he, mm. yeah, he's just the he's just the catalyst to start that conversation, isn't he? But he, he does a good job for us. <laughs> he does a brilliant job. <clears throat> it's a good, very good visual. Uh way of, of connecting to which is all quite often a very dry topic i think um i don't see any other questions coming in on the chat here but feel free to post any if you want and nothing coming in which is good we've done a great job um i guess the, the last thing for me i think would be based on george's presentation earlier we were talking about the language and tapping into people's values and having different strategies and so on i wonder if you would change anything about how you're working right now and adapt both from his and 
uh, shit on cap whether you'd have a different approach based on his feedback yeah we were talking earlier about kind of trying to get get to know our audiences and there's some work being done within home energy scotland to kind of um break down who we're engaging with and how they prefer to engage and what their motivations are and i think that's that's constantly on our mind and trying to make sure that we um are are pitching the message right for them to to really engage and there's so many different motivating factors with energy efficiency whether it's um, reducing fuel bills whether it's being more comfortable whether it's helping the environment so um i'd say it's always been something that's sort of to the forefront of our mind and, and that definitely mm. continues and we're always working to, to see what we can do to improve that. Yeah, I'd say from our point of view, um, because um, we tend to see a lot of people that are not very engaged in from a climate point of view, from an environmental point of view. So most of most of what we do from a client's point of view looks as though it's money money saving. So it's helping people tack, tackle fuel poverty, even though the consequences environmentally are sound. Um, from a client's point of view, it looks as though it's financial saving. Just, just sorry, sorry the post is here. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, funnily enough, I've just ordered a hive, so it might be that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess, find my train of thought again. Um, because we work with people that are maybe not necessarily doing it for an environmental reason, I think George's presentation was really interesting to know that actually you don't have to take those people right to the very, the, the pinnacle of their um, behaviour. It's just moving people along the journey. So I think that's really encouraging for a project like ours to know that that that's important and that that, that has value. Because sometimes you'd like to see people with their perfect um heating system and everything fully insulated and all the renewable kit, but that's not entirely realistic. Um, and we need to, it, it's I don't know if it's more or just as important to bring the people along that have not yet taken that first step. And I think that's something that, that that's probably our role in this, I'd say. Great. Well, there's a question here from my boss, Alistair. Uh, how are you getting on with older people who might struggle with remote tech for advisory visits? Yeah, do you guys want to go first yeah. with that? Oh, go on, you. Oh, yeah, um, um, like I say, we offer um, appointments either by phone or by Zoom. We do tend to find um, the older people maybe like the phone instead. But I have had a few um, um, older folk who have maybe asked, you know, um, or tried out the Zoom as a sort of a, a sort of an option. Um, and we've found that it works really well. It's not as scary as they maybe think. Um, and I, um, I think that... The Zoom is is is, so, is much more beneficial for me because I suppose when when you're seeing someone face to face, you can you can gauge a lot more, um, and even from you know having an insight into someone's room, you can kind of see, um, you know maybe the the age of the property, etc., things like that. Um, so for me, it's definitely a benefit, but I suppose it's not for everybody, and it's, I suppose giving folk different options uh, is important in, in how they engage with us. I'd agree that that older people seem. Like the phone is is often the preferred option, which is you know fantastic for us with our um, phone advice line. Um, but there's also been a lot of really good work going on in Scotland, um, kind of expedited over the past few months around digital inclusion and getting people connected. So um, lots of funding towards getting people the devices, but also um, setting up community groups to be able to to get people confident using those devices as well so um by no means is, is everybody online and able to engage digitally but it is definitely um getting better and, and skills and confidence are improving Great. i'm gonna to have to leave you guys but what i'll do is i'll just let you carry on looking at the chat and uh, let you finish off on any questions up here thank you hi Al. thanks Is that us, I think? Is he so we? I think so. I think, yeah, I think she's... There you are. <laughs> on a bit of back again. To catch the posty. Oh, you, your audio's off. Is it? Yeah, I think you're muted, Isa. would have carried on for the whole session there. One thing I was going to add, um, I see the question from Lillian about um, BME communities who don't have access to technology. Um, 
something that we've not started yet, but I know that the procedure has been put into place is to actually use our office, um, so our Citizens Advice Bureau, um, use one of our rooms to actually provide people with the access to Zoom. So um, but I don't think anyone's actually taken it up yet, have they, Alia? But I know the procedures are in place so that if somebody doesn't have access to Zoom to speak to an advisor within our team or to have, um, like you said, to have a three-way um, discussion, say with a housing support worker or our colleague was speaking the other day about somebody um, from Women's Aid needed um, their person involved as well. Um, but this person didn't have access. To, um, if somebody didn't have access to technology, we could then provide that um, within our office in a safe space. We, I don't think we've had anyone take it up, but I guess that's a, quite an easy way to um, to provide for those people um, so that they don't miss out on that on that service. That sounds fantastic. I think a lot of the solutions are quite um, in the community. You know, it needs it needs everybody, and that sounds really good. Yeah, I think we've they've also worked with the library as well. I know that we've put a few people the library's way because our local library will help people um, to that they've actually got a telephone there so for example we've had people not related to energy but are trying to look at the um, EU settlement scheme that's mm. coming up next year um, and a lot of a lot of people that are, are going through that process don't have smartphones and the application is, is primarily on a smartphone so we've directed people to the library for example and they have a smartphone that somebody can just come in and use wow. and so that, that could be another option to just partner up with a local library and, and let people access it through that. Fantastic. 